It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Yukon Huang. Yukon is an expert on China's economy and its impact in the East Asian region and the world. He was country director at the World Bank from 1997 to 2004 and currently serves as a senior fellow in the Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. His most recent book is Cracking the China Conundrum, Why Conventional Economic Wisdom is Wrong. Yukon, it's great to have you here. And um, I think if you pretty much, if your subtitle is why everybody else is thinking is wrong, it means you have something to add to this conversation and, and tell us why it's right. So um, I'd, like, I'd like to ask you just to sort of hit the high points for a second. And I will say that having read the book, it's clear to me that you, in fact, have a really interesting story to tell. So if you could give us a little bit of an, an insight as to what the primary purpose of writing the book was, that would be great. You know, when I was living in, in Beijing, working for the World Bank for seven, seven years, and then I continued to live there since I have an apartment, came back to Washington, semi-retired, joined Carnegie, and Carnegie even wanted me to write about China. And I said, well, I'm not sure. I never wrote for the public. And I started reading reading what people talked about, what they were writing about in Washington. And the first thing that struck me, Bruce, was what people in Washington were worrying about, I didn't worry about at all in China. <laughs> and what I worried about in China, people in Washington didn't worry about. And that made me wonder, how come? Why is that? Location obviously matters. But when I got into it and thought about it, and I'm an economist by training, I used to teach economics. I've traveled throughout China, every single province in China for many weeks. I said to myself, there's a lot that people are right that's actually just basically wrong, okay? And at first I thought it was a Western problem, a problem in Washington, a problem in New York or London. Frankly, when I got into it further and further, I realized I had a problem. I had gotten it wrong. I was working under a framework that was very Beijing-centric, very World Bank-centric. So that's the title of my book, Conventional Economic Wisdom is Always Wrong. <laughs> and the question is, who is conventional? It could be the general public. It could be economists and financial people working in China. It could be Chinese specialists. It could be Western policymakers. It can be Chinese policymakers. So in my 10 chapters, I cover topics where each of these audiences, the people who have a vision of China, are basically wrong. And I start off with public perceptions. There are two fundamental questions that I start off with. Pew and Gallup survey Americans every year for 20 years. The question is, who is the world's leading economic power? Okay? 15 years ago, 70% of the Americans would say we are. Only 10% would say China. Today, 70% of Americans say China is. Okay? Very few people think America is. 30% think America is. Now, if you ask the same question to the Chinese, who is the world's leading economic power? They will overwhelmingly say America is. So who's right, who's wrong? And this is ironic, because usually you try to boast about yourself, not about the others. And the Chinese are right. America is the leading economic power. But why do Americans not realize this? Now, if you go back 15 years, same time period, the question is slightly different. Essentially, do you like or dislike China? Are you unfavorable or favorably disposed to China? It's hard to imagine, but 15 years ago, overwhelmingly, American views of China was positive. And today, it's quite negative. Even five or six, seven, seven years ago, it was quite positive. But I'm sure everyone in the audience today, anyone who knows China fairly well, would actually find it kind of hard to imagine that views were so strongly positive, OK? And my book is basically say, why? Because much of these views are wrong. And why are they wrong? Because there are economic factors shaping these views, which are totally misunderstood. So I begin with public perceptions, and then I go on to technical issues, debt, trade, foreign investment, corruption, political liberalization, foreign policies, and here's what people think, Western views, American views, very important point, it's always wrong. And if it's wrong, the policy recommendations are wrong. No wonder the U.S.-China foreign policy dialogue is so messed up. You begin with the wrong perceptions, you're going to have the wrong policy recommendations. And, you know, it's a regional thing, too. I mean, I think, generally speaking, the coast, particularly the West Coast, understands, I think, a, a little more uh, in depth why China matters so much. We just did a major study on inbound investment from China and in innovation. 
And one of the things that was interesting in that discussion when we had roundtables in Washington, I mentioned to the to mm -hmm. privately, mm -hmm. it was very negative. People were like, you're giving way too much away to the Chinese. Out here, it was the opposite. They told us we were being, uh, I'm sorry, in D.C., they said we were too positive, and it was a much more negative situation. On the West Coast, they said that, it was, uh, that we were actually too negative, that we should be more welcoming of Chinese investment and more positive. And I said, I must be doing something right because both sides were unhappy. But the truth of the matter <laughs> is I think this coast has a much more healthy relationship with China and what China represents. Can you, um, you kind of go a little more into that? Yes. Why, the, why the negativity and the perception? Well, just take the point that you mentioned. You were talking about Chinese investment into the United States. Let's talk a little bit more about U.S. investment going to China. What is conventional wisdom? If you're in Washington, where I live, conventional wisdom says that too much of America's foreign investment is going to China. This leads to job loss. It leads to loss of competitiveness. It's not good for the American economy. So the question is, what percent, what percent of America's foreign investment goes to China? How large is large? Now, to give you a hint, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, next door, they invest 20 to 25 percent of their foreign investment in China. That is large. Okay? So how much of America's foreign investment goes to China on average over the last 10 years? The answer is 1 percent. Practically nothing. But conventional wisdom thinks it's very large. But the reality is, it's almost negligible. Then the question is quite different. Why is there so little foreign investment going to China rather than too much? Same thing is true about trade. U.S. runs a $500 million billion trade deficit with China. $300 billion of that bilateral deficit is attributed to China, who accounts for 60% of the, has a 60% of this deficit because it has a huge surplus. So the average American would say, if I could just deal with China's massive trade surpluses with us, we can solve the trade deficit here in the U.S. and the economy would be much stronger. That's conventional wisdom. So in my chapter on trade, I basically explain why there is no relationship, no connection at all between America's trade balances and China's trade balances, even though everybody thinks there is. Now, how do I explain that to a to an average audience, because economists do a terrible job on this. It's so technical, it doesn't make any sense. You have to learn all sorts of principles that you go to graduate schools to. So I make it very simple. Go back to the year 2000. America didn't have significant trade deficits back then. And then it got really large. By 2003 or four or five, really big, almost destabilizing. Look at what was happening in China. China wasn't even running any significant surpluses for that period from 2000 to 2005. America's huge deficit became the largest they've ever been, but China hadn't had generating any surpluses at all. So how could China be actually causing America's trade problems when they didn't have any surpluses? If you take this iPhone that we all have, $650 million produced in China, $650 produced in China, export to America, how much of that iPhone, because Apple produces all its products in China, how much of that iPhone actually stays in China or is attributed to China? The answer is $25. $250 parts, components, cameras, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the computer cells in there come from South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and then $200, $300 comes from its pure profit for Apple. Okay. Now, if you think about the foreign investment question I posed to you earlier, Apple produces everything in China that it sells here, the iPhones, the iPads, whatever, the watches, okay? How much does Apple invest in China? You'd think it would be huge. The answer is zero. Apple has no foreign investment in China. All those plants, equipments, factories financed by a Taiwanese company that produces this. So we have these kinds of conventional wisdoms about trade and foreign investment, which is totally wrong. And because it's totally wrong, when we talk about the policies that the U.S. should be having to deal with these economic issues, it's totally wrong also. So uh, and what, one area that I think is interesting to me um, is, is artificial intelligence. 
Party Congress, recent Party Congress just laid out, uh, you know, artificial intelligence is one of the areas they want to go in, and that includes robotics and mm -hmm. automation. I think one of the questions I'd ask, uh, is, is, you know, ask you is, how does that factor in both the trade deficit to this idea that, that uh, um, you know, the job loss in both America and China? I mean, it, it's one of the points you make is China's the world's first country to go get, get gray before it basically gets rich. It's done both simultaneously, but uh, wouldn't, the, wouldn't automation be for the Chinese a, a necessary way of maintaining an older graying population? For China, uh, the labor force in sheer absolute numbers has been shrinking for three or four or five years. It has no choice in the future except to become more innovative and to become more automated. Uh, the numbers of people who are employed in manufacturing in China has been declining for five or six, seven years. And the interesting thing is the numbers of people who are employed in manufacturing in the US has been increasing for five to six years. But conventional wisdom would suggest the opposite that we're losing industrial jobs in China. Actually, the reverse is happening. And the reverse is happening for a very peculiar kind of a reason. China has now gotten to the income level where services are starting to take off. So the manufacturing sector is starting to shrink. The services sector is growing very rapidly. So for the foreseeable future, manufacturing is going to decline. And what they have in manufacturing is going to have to be heavily automated because they basically don't have the labor force for it anymore. Would you go in a bit to um, explain, one of the things you talk about in the book is the uh, unbalanced growth that was essentially uh, kind of pioneered by Deng Xiaoping. Mm. Um, and can you talk a little bit about why that's actually not such a bad thing in your opinion for, for China and for the global economy? Uh, I you have to explain the term first, sorry. Uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping is seen as the person who triggered the economic opening up in China. In my book, I call him the unbalanced reformer. It's a very strange term. What, what do I mean by unbalanced? Deng Xiaoping in, the, in around 1980 basically said, we've had decades of communist socialist development. We're very evenly developed. We spread our industries, our people everywhere. We spread our poverty everywhere. We're very poor, but we have equality. So he deliberately unbalanced the country in the sense of saying, I'm going to concentrate all my incentives, my resources along the coast. I'm going to open up China to the external market. I'm going to promote trade. So he channeled practically 70% of the government budget to three or four provinces, essentially ignoring the other 25. This is very unbalanced. This created a highly competitive, specialized economy geared to the external market. So this was geographically unbalanced. It also led to what I would call economic imbalances, investment shares of the economy soared. The consumption share of the economy fell. China grew extraordinarily rapidly. Now this was very good for China because the so-called unbalanced growth geographically, unbalanced growth economically, has led to wage increases of 12% a year compounded for 20 years. We in the United States are quite happy if our wages go up by two to 3% for a couple years, but think about it being compounded for 20 years. So it didn't penalize the average Chinese. Their incomes and their welfares have soared. It also made China incredibly productive. So what I say in my book is, in the West or in other economists, they tend to view un imbalances as somehow bad. And I basically write, it's actually the key to China's success. The, um, the, uh one of the things you point out or talk about is the fact that, that um, the mega cities in China, such as Beijing and Shanghai, um, which both have a population, each has a population of, of well over 20 million, particularly Shanghai. Um, you basically say that, that, in fact, not only are these cities um, uh, you know, not large enough, they, can, they need to grow a bit more. And what, it's an interesting perspective and one that I actually think it would be worth exploring. Can you give us a, a, a little bit of an insight into that? Well, I don't know how many of you have been to China. If you have, you probably went to Beijing, you probably went to Guangdong, you probably went to Shanghai. So these are, or Sunzhen if you're a business person. These are cities with populations of 20 million or more. And you go back 15 years, there were 10 or 12. And then the image is too many people. Traffic is terrible. Pollution is horrendous. Government planners' view is our mega cities are too big. We'll control the migration of people into the big cities, 
We want them to move to the smallest cities in China. So in my book, I say that's conventional wisdom. This is the view of the Chinese leadership. This is actually the view of many people who travel and visit China, that China's big cities are too big. And by now you know the, the, th the theme of my book. Conventional wisdom is always wrong. China's big cities are actually too small. If they had more people, if these cities were 30, 35 million, and they were located in the right way or developed in the right way, there'd be less pollution, less traffic problem, less congestion. So what do I mean? China has a very unique policy, uh, a very strict residency policy. You cannot move easily. And if you go to the big cities and you do it without a formal blessing, you don't have formal residency rights. 40% of the people in China's major cities along the coast are illegal migrants in the sense that they don't have residency rights. That means they can't buy homes, they can't drive a car, this children cannot go to local schools, they don't have social services, okay? So you're heavily discouraged if you go to these big cities, but you are encouraged to go to small. So Beijing and Shanghai, if you, if you go to Beijing and Shanghai, very few people realize that the core center of Beijing and Shanghai today, after all this growth in the size of the cities, there are 20% fewer people. They've been moved to the suburbs, moved out. So Beijing, when I went there in the late 90s, they had the third ring road, a beltway. Now the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. They're on Pe the eighth now, aren't hey, they? They're all moved out. When you move further out and you got to get to your job, what do you do? You drive in. Okay? It's costly. It's pollution. It's congestion. It's a horrendous thing. The core center of Beijing actually has fewer people, 20% fewer people today than it did have 10 years ago. So uh, my basic point in, the, in, the, in my book is China's big cities are actually too small. They need more people but they need to be able to live in the, in the center because globally that's what big cities do, like a New York or whatever, or a London or a Tokyo. And in fact, a key characteristic of China's big cities is that they're less dense than big cities elsewhere globally. And China's small cities are actually more dense than small cities elsewhere. It's the complete opposite of what a normal kind of a, 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 a urban, urban development would, uh, would give you. So I'd like to hit a bit here maybe on the, uh, the intersection between politics, policy, and, uh, and economics. It's actually, I think, one of the great strengths of your book. Uh, one thing I'm curious about is the role of corruption, mm. which is, uh, I think if you talk to your average American, they would probably tell you that China is a very corrupt society. We all know that, uh, that uh, uh, China's in the middle of a major, Xi Jinping's anti-corruption drive has been a major feature of China's uh, domestic policy for at least the last three years. I'd like you to chat about that because you, again, take a contrarian view on that one, too. So what is conventional wisdom about corruption? We teach everybody that the more corrupt you are as a country, the slower you grow. And this is particularly relevant for developing countries. So you look at it, Egypt or Indonesia or in India or the Middle East or whatever, you see very corrupt situations in Latin America. And, the, and, you, and you see that it seems to be causing the country to grow slower. It inhibits investment. If you don't invest, you don't grow. So that's the first conventional wisdom. The second conventional wisdom we all have is that the richer you are as a country, the less corrupt you're likely to be. So Europe, United States, rich countries are less corrupt than developing countries. That's conventional wisdom. So what do I say? It's wrong for China. I'm shocked. OK? Why is it corruption in China has directly made or allowed China to grow more rapidly than normal. Why is it that the richer it gets, the more corrupt it gets? It directly contravenes these two principles. Nevertheless, the, the general conventional wisdom, as it applies to other countries, is correct. So what is it about China that makes it different from an India or Indonesia or an Egypt, okay, or an Argentina or, or Ukraine? And the answer in my book is, this is a mixed economy. The state controls the ownership of all key resources, but the private sector is able to generate higher returns if it could use these resources. So when Deng Xiaoping faced this problem, the problem that the state controlled everything, and this is a socialist state and you can't privatize it, that would go against the, the ideology, but he realized that to get better returns, he needed to get it into the hands of private entrepreneurs 
politically, you couldn't privatize these assets. So corruption is the means by which these resources, the use of these resources, are transferred from s the state ownership to be used by the private sector. And then the question is, what about the government officials and the party? Are they supportive of this? And the answer is yes, because when they transfer it over for use, they share in the benefits. And the faster the country grows, the more you have to share. Now, that's different from other countries. If you're in India, these resources are already in the private sector. The private sector wants to do something. What it needs is the permission of a government official or somebody. Okay? And so what is the incentive for the government official? The incentive for the government official is, gee, how do I get make some money out of this? Well, I need a bribe, but I hold something back, and the more I hold it back, the more he'll pay me. So basically, I will get a bribe by stopping something. That's corruption impedes growth. In China, the official is motivated to share in the transfer and to encourage greater production, and you're better off. This is truly unique to China. But this is also a problem because Xi Jinping, as you said, wants to curb corruption. Why does he want to curb corruption? Because corruption carried to such an extreme becomes unsustainable, morally un unacceptable. Inequality is created. So he's clamping down on this. But there's a problem. If it's been a primary force for driving faster growth, and if you curb this, what do you substitute it that with? And this goes back to your point. There are implications for political liberalization, the rule of law, the nature of institutions in China, which have not yet been grappled with. So this is in my book highlighted as a major big issue that needs to be dealt with in the coming years. Well, speaking of political liberaliz lib liberalization, it does seem to me that this is one of those topics. I mean, we've associated growth, especially, uh, you know, kind of rapid uh, uh, growth uh, in, a, in a sophisticated technological society with democracy, openness, and liberalism. In fact, if arguments have been made by a number of thinkers that you really can't have uh, true innovation in an authoritarian regime because it goes in too many unpredictable ways. So I'm wondering if you see China's growth in the long term as, as um, being constrained by the fact that the, syst the system is not showing any effect of anything. It's showing terms or showing signs of becoming more authoritarian. So do you see this as a long-term impediment, to, impediment to, to China's growth or do you think it's gonna overcome it? China's going through an evolutionary process. Um, think about this. Here's a country that's been growing at almost 10% a year for three decades. What does conventional wisdom say in our textbooks about growth and development? It says you need the rule of law. You need strong institutions. You need inclusive institutions to grow rapidly. Validate across many country experiences. So how come a country with, frankly, limited development of rule of law, relatively weak, or, or what I call institutions which are not quite right, um, limited accountability in some ways, grow at 10% a year for three decades. Okay, so what is it that makes China different from an India, an Indonesia, a Bangladesh, a, a Colombia, or Africa, or a Nigeria? Two things, extraordinarily competitive economy because it competes externally, very always open in terms of trade, Secondly, extraordinarily competitive internally because the provinces compete against each other. You have 25, 30 provinces. They both operate, they invest, they do businesses. And you have state enterprises and you have private firms. They all compete. In India, the states do not compete with each other. Now, how does a, how does a province compete? A province competes because it supports economic activity, but it competes because the head of the province, the party secretary of a province, or the governor of the province, doesn't come from the province. He's appointed from Beijing with the mandate that he needs to basically develop, improve, and do something to get the conditions better. He's competing with leaders elsewhere. And if he succeeds, he gets promoted. So somebody like Xi Jinping has worked in four or five major leadership positions in different parts of China. And if he does well, gets promoted. This creates a competition that you do not see. That's very different. Now, your question about whether this can continue is a, is a very interesting and difficult question. There's a lot of what I call 
issues of social tensions. Uh, China measures or records the numbers of social incidents. A social incident is when more than two or three people get together and protest. It could be trivial. It could be a family <laughs> argument if you have a big enough family. It could be an <laughs> argument of, of a firm, whatever it is. Uh, Ten years ago, that number would be something like 30,000, 40,000 protests a year. That's a lot, but you have a big country, okay? And it got close to 100,000, and they stopped publishing this number, okay? It's very large. Social protests and the cost of dealing with social protests in China is expensive. So the cost of the internal security, maintenance of the internal security, grows rapidly. It's an economic issue. It's an economic issue because that cost is greater than the cost of supporting China's military. So here we are in the West, we worry about these battleships, these planes, these other things. What we don't realize is, and the money that's pouring into that, which is monitored by the, the, uh, the, uh, the Washington Authority, the Defense Department, the internal security costs in China now exceed the army and the military costs. So this is a big issue. There's so many protests going on. Now here's the interesting question. What does conventional wisdom say about protests? When we talk about protests, Arab Spring, Thailand, Indonesia, we ask the question, is this going to be destabilizing? Is this going to bring down the regime? So you see lots of articles which talk about potentially uh, destabilizing the situation in China. And the great irony is this kind of view is, is wrong. Protests in China, in a historical view, has helped strengthen the top leadership. Protests in other countries tends to weaken the top leadership. How can that be? Okay, and the answer is because China is a huge country which is regionally decentralized. So protests tend to be against local officials who are accused of being unfair, uh, not behaving properly, or corrupt, or whatever it is. So you're protesting against local officials, and in desperation at the very end you actually appeal to the leadership in Beijing to help. This actually strengthens. They tend to be seen as the savior of the country rather than the, 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 the force which might be driving the, the consequence. So this is what I would call why the regime has been very, very strong, actually, very successful in, in, in keeping the system going. A protest is actually the substitute for, in some ways, the rule of law or demonstrations because it, it gives a signal to the government of what is the problem and then they can deal with it. So this is very unusual. The question, however, is can this continue? Yep. Right? And it's also, I think, the question of what kind of a drag it produces for China's economy over time. And as I said to you, the economic costs of this are significant. The frictional cost now, as the economy becomes more complicated, mm -hmm. it becomes more services-oriented, less industrial-oriented, it is an issue. In my book, I basically talk about what are the likely forces that would drive what I would call political liberalization over the longer term? And I spent a lot of time reading about political scientists writing about democracy, human rights, and, and case examples of what might be the path for China. And again, my book says that's conventional wisdom. It's totally wrong. What would be the right comparators for China? So one question, again, you know, I, I think I've danced around a little bit. I should just address it directly. Is this whole issue of social um, stability, which I think, you know, is acknowledged to be, uh, we every every country in the world has issues of social stability. We have it certainly in the United States, but we have different mechanisms, uh, you know, elections and things that release that that tension. In China, I think social stability is a greater concern to a one-party state. So a couple of questions. One is. What's the role of state-owned enterprises in that? Because an enormous amount of China's economic uh, power is tied up in, in SOE, state-owned enterprises. And yet much of the innovation, I think, comes from the private sector. You don't expect a lot of innovation out of SOEs. So I'm wondering if you can address that, that's something of that conundrum, because I do think in the long run, if China is going to be an innovative country, it's going to have to focus more on the, on the private sector now. I, I, uh, my book basically highlights this is a country which is increasingly dominated by services, less by industry, increasingly dominated by private companies rather than state companies. There will be state companies in the strategic areas. Um, areas like the use of the internet, banking, China is advancing f much faster than we would have ever expected. When I went to China, and if you go to China, you probably will say, 
I need to open my bank account. I need to make sure my credit cards are fine. And I suddenly realized people don't use checks, okay? <laughs> people don't use and use credit cards. <laughs> it's really kind of actually quite difficult to travel there because everyone pays all their bills with their phone, okay? They've skipped a generation. We're way behind in some ways, okay? And this is happening in the, in the Alibabas compared to the Amazons. They're doing all sorts of things. So in my book, I actually highlight this, this kind of a question. Will this drive what I call uh, the need or forces for what I call more systemic political liberalization? And my answer to that answer is probably will in some form. But how long will it take? I compare uh, uh, China with other authoritarian regimes, which are economically very successful, because that's my comparator. And the answer is there are very few of them. Authoritarian and economically successful. But South Korea and Taiwan are two examples. Okay. And I find it kind of interesting that Taiwan and South Korea became politically liberal in the same year, at the same income level, at the same level of urbanization, at the same levels of services, high value services. Why is that? In my book, I speculate about the information flow, and the need to disseminate and link up. And this is where I think is it pressure on the system? And it's going to be increasingly filled over, I would say, the next 10 years. Hmm. So I'll take some questions from the audience here. And if you have them, I just I think hold them up. Um, when will and when and how will China address its debt problem? How successful will it be? And what are the implications for the global economy? Conventional wisdom says that China has a financial problem, a debt problem. 99% of the financial papers will say that. So I have a chapter, 30 pages I have on there. And my point is, debt is not a problem in China. It's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. So how do I turn a concern that everyone has into a good thing? Well, first of all, let me just point out, what is China's debt ratio? That is household, government, corporate debt as a share of GDP. The number is 260%. And it's very high because it used to be 150 so it's going up 100 percentage points. It's 260 percent of GDP. Is this good or bad? It's exactly the same as America's. It's the same as England's. If you rank the top 80 countries, it's right in the middle. It's lower than most developed. It's higher than most developing. And then the question then is, what is China? A developing or developed country? And the answer is neither, really. It's something in between. It's exactly, therefore, what I would predict it to be. So it's level. It's not the issue. What is the issue is it increased so rapidly. So why did it increase so rapidly? Because the analysts say every country where it increased this rapidly over a 10-year period, every one of them has collapsed. Why not China? And I basically argue there's something very different about China that is not true in any of these other countries, but no one realizes it. And it is the role of land prices. Now here in San Francisco, you're very familiar with land prices and property. So if your property prices double over 10 years, you start worrying about whether it's too high, you worry about a bubble, right? So what happened to property prices in China over the last 10 years? They went up 600%, six time increase, okay? Now when the property prices go up six fold, it affects not only houses, which are new, uh, shopping malls, even roads, because it's land value, Debt surges, right? And the issue then is, is this sustainable? Is a crash coming? And the conventional wisdom would say, if some property prices go up 600%, you surely have a crash. And the answer in my book is, you don't have one. Why isn't it? Because there was no private property 10 or 15 years ago. So this surge is going from practically nothing to something which is what you'd expect for Asia. So the question now is, if you go to Beijing, property prices are high. But are they too high? So what is the right comparator? So I use India. Let's compare property prices in India, New Delhi with Beijing, Bombay with Shanghai. Now India per capita incomes are one third China's. Its growth rate over the last 15 years is about half. Conventional wisdom would say that India's property prices today would be somewhat lower than China's. But in fact, they're twice as high. But no one writes about India having property bubble, but everyone writes about China. So in my book, I point out that this is a country where the debt surge is largely because of the surge in property, 
And it's a catch-up because it didn't have private property. It's really just bringing it up to what is normal. But no one actually realizes that because it's the only country that has this phenomenon. Every other country has had private property forever. So this is a very unusual situation. Are you worried about social, social stability, uh, especially that from an income disparity point of view? Well, China's Gini coefficient, Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality. Right. So one, a coefficient of one means that one person owns everything. A Gini coefficient of zero means that everybody's income is exactly equal. So a good number is something like 0.4. Uh, when it gets to 0.5 or, 0.5 or 6, it gets very high. So China's uh, indicator of inequality, when it started off under Dung, it was like 0.25, very low. Social economy, very equal. It soared to 0.45, close to 0.5, became very unequal, very much like Latin America numbers, very unequal. But it is exactly the same as America's, by the way. It's the same as Singapore's, it's the same as Malaysia. That's not unusual. What is unusual in China is the distribution of wealth is very unequal. The ownership of assets and the people who have property. But even that is a bit strange because the people who are billionaires are those who have somehow got into property. Somewhat that's true in the United States, but not so much. The United States, I think, is the internet. It's the e-commerce. That's where the real wealth is. In China, it's the property. But the interesting thing in China about property and, and that kind of wealth, unlike America, is that 90, 90, maybe 95% of the Chinese own their homes. Okay. And that's because in the late 90s, the state gave the rights to the homes or the, to everybody where you're in rural urban areas. You could buy your property from the state for an, a fairly nominal amount. So you have a very interesting situation in China. A very large number of what I call average people have a built-up equity that Americans don't have, unless you were lucky now in, in the U.S. to have owned a home. They do. So there's a wealth build up that's just pretty broad, but there's also a, a concentration of wealth uh, build up from those who happen to have a much greater access to, to property. So I have a question here that says, can you explain the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative and its effects on the American economy? <laughs> the One Belt, One Road is this proposal to essentially take uh, the Silk Road land roads connecting Asia with Europe, uh, the maritime roads that go through Southeast Asia, the Malacca Straits, the Middle East, uh, the canal to Europe. So there's a maritime route, there is a land route. China, under Xi Jinping, has made this, I would say, their major foreign policy economic venture, uh, the biggest one. I think Xi Jinping thinks that this will be the defining uh, foreign policy uh, uh, initiative uh, for the coming three or four or five decades, and it will re reshape relations. Think of China. People call China the Middle Kingdom. Okay. And what Xi Jinping basically said is, for a Middle Kingdom, all we've been dealing with is the Pacific, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, U.S., Canada. And when they look that way these days, they just see a lot of problems. <laughs> okay. So he says, let's look the other direction. Central Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, across Russia to Europe. And they say, I think I see friendlier faces. Okay. So the One Belt, One Road is a program to support the building of infrastructure, power plants, connectivity, logistics, connecting 65 countries, potentially costing maybe one or two trillion dollars. And China says, this is good for everybody because if we can link up, it'll improve investment, trade, it'll be good for everybody. And it's infrastructure. And why is it infrastructure is so important? Because China basically says, that's how we made it. People don't actually realize it, but it was the building of infrastructure that made China such a great economic or trading nation. And if we can just increase these links. So the issue for the US is the following, is this bad or good? Now, the good aspect is global growth stability, if it happens, is good for everybody. $18 billion has been allocated to Pakistan from, from China for this program. And several corridors. China's view is the following. If I can actually stabilize Pakistan, basically bring development, 
and deal with this issue of rising terrorism and disaffected communities, everybody benefits. I can't deal with this in terms of a military security approach, but if I could channel and create trade channels, maybe that would be my contribution to the, what I would call the, the problems in the Middle East. So I personally think that as long as these projects make sense, as long as countries know what they want and they're, and they're doing it properly, the One Belt, One Road is, in theory, good for everybody. Now, how can the U.S. benefit directly? Well, the money in the flow is up to anyone who wants to participate and join. So American uh, designers, transport logistics, engineers, uh, people who are dealing with any of these kinds of trade issues, the financing issues, those opportunities are open to everyone. Chinese media, the, the Communist Party and, uh, has, has, um, has been using the Trump administration in the 2016 U.S. elections as an example of a failure of, West, of the West and, and in particular the U.S., um, especially de U.S. democracy. It's also used to uh, praise and portray China's political system and economic policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries um, as a more, in a more positive light. Can you uh, comment on the effectiveness of this? I think that certainly with the, the elections here in the U.S., as well as what I would call um, political maneuverings in Europe, whether it's a Brexit or the challenges in Germany or other, other areas, are basically raising questions about uh, stability and the direction of democracies globally. I think it's an issue that everyone has to wrestle with. And they are obviously saying that the uh, weaknesses and strengths of the Western systems are now being exposed. And what we have in China in comparison looks a little bit better for the, for the Chinese themselves. Let's go back a little bit further. Go back to the global financial crisis. For two decades or three decades, China was saying our model for economic development, growth, and financial development was the West but they turned out to be also vulnerable to instability. Now, having said that, if you poll the Chinese, the average people, you see in their results tremendous admiration for the, what I would call the U.S., its values, its systems, its institutions, uh, the things that we all take for granted here in many ways. That's why you see so many Chinese trying to send their children to school here. So if you, whether you're here or here in the U.S. or whether you're in Europe, the thing that I find striking is how many Chinese are going to overseas for schooling, not just for graduate school, but for elementary school and high school. So you have a president who sent his daughter to undergraduate at Harvard. Okay. That is a very unusual fact. So this, what I would describe it as it both a love-hate relationship in terms of the, the views of what America stands for is a big, big issue of, of discussion. I think this is an issue that both sides have to think about for the future. Well, that leads into my next question, which what will happen to the U.S.-China rela uh, trade relationship because of the U.S. Uh, it says leaving the TPP. We actually never joined it, but, but uh, withdrawing from the, from the TPP. And um, we have now a Chinese analog to it, or some people think of it as a, China, a, a Chinese analog to it. So where do you think the U.S. Um, relationship with China, at least in the trading, uh, trading world, is going to go after, during and after Trump's administration? Well, as an economist, I, I basically say to myself that we economists have done a terrible job in trying to explain the benefits of trade. We've always tried to say that free trade or open trade or globalization it's going to be good for everybody. And the answer is it won't, will not be good for everybody. There will be winners and losers. Uh, mm -hmm. In theory, there are more winners than there are losers, but there are definitely losers. We do not have a good way of compensating losers in a democracy. Uh, we can't just say, you are losing your job and please move here and get something else. It doesn't, isn't that easy. So we don't have a good system for dealing with this. So we fail miserably in, in accounting for that. We don't know how to deal with productivity increases which leads to job losses. So much of the trade tensions in America is because of productivity increases. Some estimates of maybe 70% of the job losses have been productivity increases. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it is true that trade creates jobs here, destroys jobs there, and they're not the same people. 
So we don't know how to deal with this issue. So I think the trade tensions between China and the United States are certainly going to get worse in the coming year. When President Trump came back from his visit in China, most people had a big sigh of relief because that visit went reasonably well in terms of the press forecasts and no tensions. But now most people who are close to the ground realize that there's going to be what I call a lot of provocative actions probably coming in terms of the administration certifying China's behavior as not being fair and equitable, uh, potentially levying of punitive tariffs. They just declared China's a non-market economy a, a couple of days ago. Why is that significant? It, it allows more flexibility for uh, U.S. policymakers to slap punitive tariffs on China. So a system of retaliation is going to occur. So in my book, I basically say, of course, this is really bad for everybody. Uh, I emphasize, of course, that America's trade problems, trade deficits, have nothing to do with China. If you think about it, America's had a trade deficit every year for 40 straight years. And if you go back far enough, China wasn't even significant. But America's had a deficit for 40 straight years. So how do you explain... America can have a deficit 40 straight years because you in the audience, you run a household, you would realize, of course, you can't be totally borrowing or spending more than you earn for 40 straight years. Somebody would stop lending to you. Your bank would not allow this to happen. The answer is very simple. It's because America's dollar is the global currency. And this is something that non-technical people do not understand. If the dollar is the global currency and people want to hold it globally, America must run a trade deficit because that's the only way that you can get the U.S. dollar out there globally. You run a deficit, you pay your bills in dollars, the world uses these dollars for trade or for whatever purposes. So as long as the dollar is the global currency, America will always have a deficit. It has nothing to do with China or Japan or Mexico or Canada. Nevertheless, policymakers and the general public constantly think that it is being caused by somebody. And then we have this issue about foreign investment. We think there's something wrong that we invest too much in China. We actually don't invest enough. So the solution to this is, what about the TPP? And clearly, America should have been in the TPP, should have stayed with the TPP. It's good for America. But here's the great irony. It was being sold as something to sort of like contain China, because China wasn't part of the TPP. And think about what the purpose of the TPP is. It's to set high-level standards in trade, environmental labor practices. If you really want to influence China, you want China to be part of the TPP. You want them to be bound by these rules. You want to change their behavior. You want to up the, up the ante. So my book basically says, not only should America be in the TPP, leading the TPP, but America should ask China to be in the TPP because America's goal is to set the standards for the world. Okay? Now, China's leading another a trade discussion called the RCEP which does not have the U.S. in it. My message for China is you should, ask China, you should ask the U.S. to be part of this. I think they did, didn't they? And America's not quite ready for this, right? No. So trade issue is kind of funny. You only succeed if you can get everybody to be part of it. Yet we constantly talk about excluding people or making it bilateral. It doesn't make any sense. And I think there's also a lot of legitimate concerns about American companies not being received in a impartial and open fashion uh, in China. There are many areas where American companies cannot invest. And certainly my book basically says China needs to realize that by opening up those sectors to more foreign companies, both sides will benefit. It will generate jobs for Americans or generate jobs for Chinese. Well, what's the incentive for them to do that? China has actually realized that. They've already started saying, I'm going to open up. They've already opened up certain financial sectors. They're going to open up more sectors. So they made the decision. But Things are very slow in China. <laughs> well, I think uh, they may be moving kind of slowly here in the United States, too. Uh, one of the things you were mentioning earlier about this, I, I think one of the, the interesting issues for me in the Trump administration is the, you know, who's running the policy on, in, on commerce, you know, on, on trade. Is it Wilbur Ross? Is it Peter Navarro and Lighthizer? I mean, there are some serious issues now. And um, I guess it's not really in the realm of your book, but mm. it, it's worth noting. I mean, would you say, A, the Trump administration's approach to China so far has been effective, and B, uh, who's going to win this tussle in Washington to decide kind of how we do interact with the Chinese and with the rest of the world? Well, the first thing I would point out is that 
what I call anti-China sentiments in terms of trade and foreign investment is not exclusively a Republican view. The Democrats have always shared this. Okay, no. After you go back historically, the Democrats were more protectionist than Republicans. And now, to me, as an economist, I'm just made by the fact that both Democrats and Republicans, they all share this kind of protectionist kind of sentiment. And uh, what we were relying upon, actually, was the leadership, whether they are the, at the presidential level or, or the advisory or economist levels, that they would understand a little bit more of what's going on and get above this kind of... Uh, a view that a trade or investment is bad for jobs and, and that kind of a problem. So I think that collectively, um, both sides have a problem in terms of trying to recognize this. But the, the irony in China, of course, is that Xi Jinping now sees uh, the virtue of, of pushing or supporting globalization or freer trade because China has benefited enormously from this process. And America now is seen as being protectionist. And the great irony, of course, is, you know, 20 years ago was exactly the opposite. The U.S., Europe were tr arguing for free trade. Developing countries were saying it's not fair. We, don't, we lose jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's exactly the opposite. It's a tremendous turnaround in events. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're in for a, a very difficult period. Uh, the Western economic political systems have not been able to deal with the issue of how do I deal with the people who lose out with globalization in an effective manner either in our tax systems or our social infrastructure, we don't, have a, we don't have a means of doing so. How do we deal with productivity uh, changes? How do we deal with the fact that wage increases in the U.S. have not been more than 1% a year for 10 years now in some ways? It just doesn't happen anymore. We, we haven't been able to deal with this in a constructive fashion. You could argue that I think uh, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at American policy now, um, which is to reduce taxes, to, to put more, at least uh, theoretically, put more financial um, decisions in the hands of the individual. And then you take a country like China or even Canada or France, which has a much more socialized medical mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. you know, a pension system. You could probably argue that, in fact, in some ways, the Chinese may be better prepared for this than, than the United States. That's a leading question. I recognize that. I, I think they're better prepared for it in, in, a, in a particular way that's not so obvious sometimes. When Xi Jinping talks about his strategy, his programs, he, for example, he came out with this uh, industrial program and this, uh, at the party congress, he launched the vision of the China. And that vision is 35 years, broken into two 15-year periods. So his vision of what he wants China to be is defined by a vision of what he thinks China should be in the year 2049 with streams of policies and things that should need to be implemented. If you contrast that issue, the being able to think long term, with the problem we have in America, where we're essentially motivated by a congressional election or a, a two-year election or a presidential cycle, and everything is geared toward winning that and what you have to do about it, it really makes it difficult to think about long term issues in a more neutral and balanced way. We're just heavily catering to what I call conventional wisdom. And as my book says, if conventional wisdom is actually wrong, then the strategies and recommendations that we actually pursue in a long-term sense tend to be wrong. And but I also will say that my book, I point out the same thing as a problem for China, but in different ways. So turning to environmental concerns, uh, pollution makes it hard to breathe in China, I'll say. Uh, Major cities, uh, it affects health and longevity of the population. Is this a problem? Can it be solved and when? I think there's a, a kind of a bigger picture here, too, which is that, of course, it too feeds into social stability. Um, but an important point to make is that it's way worse in India than it is in China now in the major cities. But I guess the question is twofold. One, are the Chinese going to address the issue? And two, if they are going to address it, what are the motivations for that? I, I think this is a very good question. When, when I went to China in 1997 for the first time, landing in Beijing, I saw the sun maybe twice a month. And maybe once a, once a week, planes couldn't land in Beijing. Yeah. So pollution is a problem in Beijing today, but relatively speaking, it's actually a lot better than it was you know, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So it's actually improved. Why is it that Xi Jinping is willing to sign on to the climate change initiatives? Why is he willing to basically say, we are trying to deal seriously with environmental concerns and we'll set targets? Why is he experimenting with carbon taxes and other kinds of issues that we won't even talk about in this country? Why is it there's such a big difference between the, the leadership views in China today compared to 10 years ago 
and compare with America. Because when I first went to China 10 or 15 years ago, I don't think the leadership wanted to talk about climate change, didn't want to talk about pollution. They didn't want the, the, the uh, particulate uh, uh, readings to be publicized because the citizens would become unhappy. So what has fundamentally changed? One, the middle class is now more prosperous. They're breathing this air, they're worried about pollution, it's a serious issue. So politically today, they worry more about the environment than they worry about jobs because the number of people in the labor force is actually shrinking. So it's not jobs that's an issue, it's the quality of life. Now the second thing here is, it's kind of interesting. What is the leadership, how does the leadership deal with this issue of environmental concerns and climate change in a different way than we have here in America? And the difference is in China, they see dealing with climate change and environmental issues as a growth strategy, that you can make money from this, that you can develop new technologies, produce better equipment, you can sell it to yourselves, you can sell it to others. It's a growth driver. Here in America, for whatever reasons, we see environment and climate change as inhibiting growth, as a cost burden. Obviously, we spread it among policymakers and the public in a way that makes it sound like this will cost us jobs, whereas in China, they think it will gain jobs. Okay? That Completely is a really, different. really important point. Mm. And we've done a lot, actually, on this issue of sustainability. And I think one of the interesting things about the Chinese is that they've actually, uh, that twofold process of one wanting to deal with it, but the second point is really important, which is it is a business opportunity. It will save companies in the long term, and I think China has really recognized that. Um, traditional wisdom in the, in the U.S. believes that a growing middle class will challenge the authority of the party, the Communist Party, and the ruling elites. And the question is for comments. This, is, this flows a little bit from my earlier questions about uh, you know authoritarianism and liberalization but uh, what, what are your views on that well the issue here if you're talking about political liberalization in the growing middle class is what is the middle class what do they aspire to and for three decades the view was that Chinese were aspiring for a better life and they're coming from poverty so if your incomes are increasing by 10 percent a year for every year and jobs are, are f relatively abundant uh, you don't worry too much about political liberalization. That was what Deng Xiaoping was operating under. Xi Jinping sees this quite differently now. In the 19th Party Congress last month, he dropped references to growth targets. He talked much more about the quality of growth. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks more about this concept of a harmonious society, both internally and externally. Okay. Uh, and he sees this as the issue or where China needs to go over the next several decades. So it's not something you achieve in one year. It's basically a view of China, a prosperous, harmonious, innovative, and also globally powerful country, all right? Okay. So there's, a, there's also a nationalism in this. Remember, 200 years ago, China was by far the world's globally most powerful economy. Then it sank to nothing. So this is a different kind of power. In my book, I call China the abnormal economic power, the abnormal power, the abnormal great power the first developing country to be a global power, the first great power that gets old before it gets rich, the first returning great power. There are all sorts of things which are different about China as a great power than normal great powers. It also means that you operate differently. And if you don't truly understand that, it gets more difficult to deal with a great power. So this is all part of the issue. Nationalism comes in, a different kind of quality of life, uh, economic prosperity continues in some way through innovation. And then your question about um, political liberalization, representation, freedom in various different ways. I personally think that that is a natural aspiration of people. And within the system, they talk about greater representation, greater flexibility in this, but coming from within the party. So the key for them is therefore also preservation of the party. That reform has to come from within the party. So any question of looking at China evolution of political sense has to look at that evolution as what kind of evolutions do we see that come from within an authoritarian regime rather than being coming from the outside. And if one studies that more carefully, one has a better idea of what are the possible mechanisms. And I'll talk a little bit about this in my book, where that kind of pressure point might emerge from. Well, I thought, and we talked a little bit about this before the, before the event, it is interesting. The last 200 years has been, for the United States, since its inception, 
has been largely a climb to global prominence. For China, and, and uh, there's a fascinating economist, an English economist, Angus Madsen, um, who looked at global GDP. I mean, China and India together, I think, in 1500 accounted for about 60%, mm. 65% of the global GDP. I think in, in, um, in 1950, it was down around 4%. So the, the, the change was enormous. So China, you know, in most of the time that the United States has been a country, China has been uh, not a major part of the economic system, the global economic system. But if you're Chinese, you look at the last 200 years and you just say, okay, that was not such a great 200 years, but we're back. For the United States, though, it changes a perception because we don't have that history. I'm wondering if you can just briefly, because we're pretty much running out of sure. time here, comment a little bit on that. Well, if as an American, and I see a rising China, and people write about the Thucydides trap, you know, rising major power confronting Grand the Allison. dominant power, that you're going to surely have a conflict. I, I don't see that as, as being an appropriate analogy. There's two things we have to realize. Emerging market economies, including China, are going to grow at three or four or five percent, six percent, faster than developed countries. So they're going to converge. China's a very big country, so it's going to be the world's biggest economy. What is it that shift is going to happen? And there's going to be a change in political power relations of some form. But what is really important for America? What's important for America is not that this relative convergence doesn't happen, it will happen. Just a question of how long it takes. It's that America continues to grow and because its income levels, here we are, we have sixty thousand dollars per capita GDP. China's is around ten or twelve. We're five times as big. Okay. Even if China grows at five or six percent, as long as we grow at two and a half or three in a sustained fashion, in an absolute sense, I would say America's prosperity, its global role can continue in what I would call a reasonable, reasonably useful and powerful role. So it's, what is really important, therefore, is for America to get its own act together. <laughs> Don't worry too much about them growing at four or five or six. We have to worry about make sure that we continue to grow two or three. And if we do this, and our income is six times as large, the absolute increase in America's GDP, frankly, is still going to be greater. Okay. So this is what I call a relative as opposed to absolute convergence. We, f we focus too much upon relative issues. We just need to make sure that in an absolute sense, the U.S. continues to prosper and prosper in the right way. So Yukon, we're out of time. One last question, really brief. Are you bullish or bearish on the relationship between the U.S. and China moving forward? My view about, as an economist always, is that we all have incentives for improving our lives. That's true for the Chinese, it's always true for Americans. The question is whether our systems have the structures and incentives so that they can see that and they can understand that. I think that we are in a difficult period right now in America. We're focusing too much on narrow things. We don't think long term. I think to me that's the biggest challenge. The biggest thing I've learned from working on China for the last since I went to work on China for 1997, before that I worked on other countries. The biggest thing I learned about China was the power of long-term thinking and be able to act on long-term. We don't act long-term. We don't have any long-term plans on anything, actually, as far as I can see, whether it's education or infrastructure or health. We don't have any long-term views about what we want to be 15 years from now. They do. In the beginning, it's easy to sort of like to deride this and say it's unrealistic. But th the reality is that China, when they develop these long-term plans, they pretty much follow these things very carefully. And the issue for me is, how do you introduce that kind of strategic long-term thinking? How do you get that validated in America? And then for the U.S. in dealing with China, get China in terms of the same wavelength in terms of what are mutually compatible paths? And what does this, how do you define this, both economically and politically? I mean, to me, frankly, if both sides are doing well economically, there's a lot of flexibility to have what the Chinese would call win-win solutions. Right now, we tend to focus too much on win-lose. I do something which is actually going to benefit me, but it's going to hurt you. And that's what we're doing right now under protectionist kinds of uh, discussions with China. Well, on that, I'm going to end, this, end the program. But um, the book is called Yukon Huang, Cracking the China Conundrum. And you can get it here tonight. He'll sign copies. And Yukon, thank you so much for
what was a really interesting insight into the relationship between the U.S. and China. Thank you for moderating this. Thank you.